All right. Let's welcome Allison Kaptur, and she's going to be presenting on important decisions. Is the audio okay here? Yeah. Great. I'm Allison Kaptur. I'm a facilitator at Hacker School, a writer's retreat for programmers in New York City. So if you have questions about Hacker School, come find me at any point in the weekend. I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, so would the 30 or so Hacker Schoolers who are here. Uh, <clears throat> Here are some places you can find me. This is my GitHub and Twitter. If you don't get a chance to get your questions answered at the end of this talk, feel free to tweet at me and I'll try to get back to you there. So I want us to picture ourselves in Amsterdam in 1989, inventing Python. For the next half hour, we are the BDFLs. Now, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to invent all of Python in the next half an hour, so we're just going to invent one piece, and that's import. Now, our hypothetical here is that everything else in Python already exists, so we can write code that we need to implement import. We're going to start with a very simple and very limited solution, and then we'll gradually look at problems as they arise and try to solve them. We'll also look at some other decisions that we could have made uh, <clears throat> and see how other languages choose to solve these problems. As a side note, import existed in its, essentially its current form in the first open source release of Python in around 1991. So there's not a record of the decision making around the structure. This is the days before mailing lists, before PEPs, uh, before the changelog even. So the main source for uh, actual history of import is Guido's brain. Uh, <laughs> and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. So let's state our problem really clearly. This is one of sharing and reusing code. So to get some code up on the, bo on the board here that we can talk about concretely, Suppose on the left-hand side that we had written some function that was very hard work, and it's a very useful function. And sometime later, on the right-hand side, we need to use that function again. So what are we going to do in the absence of import? Well, the first thing we could do is the decision that the novice programmer would make, someone who's very new to programming. They would say, this will be easy. I can copy and paste. <laughs> now, there are clearly a lot of disadvantages with this strategy, but it's worth noting that there are advantages, too. For one thing, it's very clear what we've done. So if we're reading this function, this file later, a useful function is defined right there. We don't have to go hunting for it somewhere. Oh. <clears throat> there are lots of disadvantages, and two of them are that this is annoying to do by hand, and if we subsequently find a bug in a useful function, we have to go fix it in two places. So at a minimum, we want an automatic solution that doesn't require manual copying and pasting. That's probably not the best solution that we, that we can come up with. And we want the code to stay in sync if we make changes. So let's imagine some kind of magical copy and paste. So we've got a special symbol uh, that copies and pastes your code for you. And we pass it you know, a file name or something like that. And we can imagine implementing this without any knowledge of Python at all. Basically, that just views our source code as text files and manipulates them as text files. So we would look for this special symbol that gives us a file name. We would go find that file and then replace the line uh, in our, the file we're writing today with the contents of that file that we found. And right now, this takes entire files to include. So we could choose to be more specific to say, we only want this range of line numbers pasted into the file we're writing today. That has a lot of problems as well. We would have to keep the line numbers in sync. That's probably not ideal. But it's worth noting that this is an improvement. <clears throat> we now have an automatic solution that's not uh, manual copying and pasting. And we don't have to fix bugs in two places. Our code stays in sync. So there are lots of problems with the solution still, and we'll look at four of those over the course of the next 20 or so minutes. For one thing, this is static. We can't change the behavior while the program is running. Uh, for another, we have name collisions. If we have two things with the same name, we can't tell that that'll happen. We're executing our files multiple times, which may be inefficient, but has a much more serious problem of object identity, and we'll spend a little more time on that later. And it's very rigid. There's currently only one way to do this. So let's take these one at a time. We are so far manipulating our Python files as if they are simply text files with no knowledge at all of Python or the fact that Python source code can be used to make Python objects. Now, we've invented this really great dynamic language where everything happens at runtime. So presumably our, incl our include or import solution here should happen at runtime too. So let's go one step better. We can, we can call a function to include a, a external source code. So this function we're calling magical paste. 
takes a file name as an argument, goes and finds that file and opens it, reads in the source code, and then uses the exec keyword to execute that source code. At the moment, we're using exec in the simplest way, the sort of regular way, but I want to spend just a minute on this in part because exec is not something you often see in uh, production code, and in part because we're going to get more co uh, complex with it in just a minute. So exec takes a string and executes it as Python code. Now, it differs from eval in that eval is for evaluating expressions, and exec is for any kind of Python code. So here we're defining a function, we're invoking that function, it works just the way you expect it to. So now we have a way to dynamically run Python code. Uh, <clears throat> and this code, as it's currently written, will work. We will have a useful function available to us by invoking our magical paste function. So we can solve this problem of uh, doing sort of a static analysis of a dynamic language, which was not a great idea, by using a Python uh, native function. Let's look at the second problem of name collisions. So suppose that we had another file that defined an another function named a useful function. One of those would supersede the other. We would have to know that that would happen. We couldn't tell that it would happen without reading all of the relevant source code. So how are we going to solve this? Well, luckily for us, we have had one honking great idea. We can use namespaces to avoid name collisions, just as is mentioned in the Zen of Python. Now, since we're inventing namespaces, let's spend a minute talking about them. We could have two objects that have the same name but point to different things. So we ha could have Montreal, a city in Canada, and Montreal, a town in France. And when we're speaking English, we would add extra information to disambiguate the two. Now, maybe it's more convenient for us to flip the order to start with the larger container and then get more specific as we progress. And we have this idea of a container. And that container would have some sort of boundary. In our geographic example, we have the, the country and the boundaries are obvious on Google Maps. Uh, <clears throat> we'll have to decide what defines the boundary of a namespace. But now we have this mapping of names to objects. So let's start using the word module for our container. Is a module just another kind of an object, like a class? Um, we'll see this is the decision that is made in some other languages. Um, but for us, <clears throat> let's make some, some different choices. We'll say that the boundaries of a module are one file. You don't need to use an explicit keyword to create a module. We'll also say that the module by default has the same name as the file containing its source code. So we've got a direct mapping onto the file system, which allows us to look up where modules live really easily. The upshot of these two decisions is that every time a Python programmer writes any program, she's written a module. So we're sort of tricking novice programmers into using modules right off the bat. So let's modify our function that uses exec so that it includes a namespace. This is some syntax that is not terribly common, um, so just to, to run through how it works, we can create an empty dictionary to use as our namespace and then exec our code in that namespace. When we then inspect the keys of the namespace, we see that we've picked up a reference to built-ins, which happens when you exec any code in any context. And we've also picked up a key hi that corresponds to our function object. Now, if we try to invoke the function hi in the current scope in the REPL session, we get a name error. And this is exactly the behavior that we want. We see that executing this code in another namespace has protected our current namespace from all of those names and objects. We can then reach into the namespace using the key that, it is, that is the name and get the function object itself and then invoke it normally. So our modifications to our magical paste function are to create this namespace, execute our source code in that namespace, and then return the namespace object itself. So I'm cheating in one way on this slide by using module syntax instead of dictionary syntax, which I should be using. So if we make that change, then we have valid code here. We have this pseudo module idea uh, that is a, a simple namespace of a mapping of names to objects. So we've solved our problem of name collisions. We can, we can use modules and we can use namespaces to avoid name collisions entirely. Let's look at this third problem of the code executing multiple times. So this could be inefficient. If we had a module that defined 100 functions instead of just one function, we probably wouldn't want to run it more times than necessary. Uh, our, our module could be side affecting in some way, or we could suppose that module A requires B, C, and D, 
Module B requires C and D and so on. So that as we sort of step through this, these series of modules, the problem gets worse and worse. In fact, there's a more serious problem with our code executing multiple times, and that's one of object identity. In many cases, even in most cases, we don't want just an identical object or another copy of the object that we have. We want the same object. So we could imagine writing a module that uh, sets up some object to control a server and then spins up that server. If we include that module in another file, we probably don't want another server object you know, spun up and running somewhere. We want a reference to the one that we already have. So how do we solve this problem? So one way to fix this kind of problem is with memoization. The idea behind memoization is that we keep a record of calculations that we've already done, and we don't repeat calculations when we already know the answer. So the classic example is the Fibonacci sequence. A naively recursive implementation will make two recursive calls for each function call. And so calculating Fibonacci of n requires two to the n function calls, which is incredibly inefficient, but it shouldn't take more than n. And so we can solve this problem by storing a cache, here just a dictionary of mapping uh, input to output, essentially. And if we've already calculated an answer, then we just return it and we don't calculate again. So we can use this strategy on our magical paste function. We'll keep a mapping uh, in a dictionary of file names to namespace objects. And if we've already executed a file name, then we won't execute it again. So memoization solves this problem of object identity and also uh, helps our efficiency. Our fourth problem is that this function is very rigid. There's only one way to include other code, and that's including an entire module. So we could imagine adding lots of options, um, but that doesn't get us very far. And we'll also note that, for example, on line 14, I have to say useful twice. And we decided that modules, by default, have the same name as the file that contains their source code. We're currently not implementing that idea at all. So <clears throat> if we add options, we could get, some of, we could get more flexible behavior, but we wouldn't solve this, this problem of having to say things twice. And in fact, there's not really a solution that uses a function that solves that problem, because it would be very surprising if a function modified the namespace of its caller. There's, that, that doesn't happen, generally speaking, for good reason. So we don't want this to be ugly, uh, <clears throat> and we want to have more fine control over our namespace. So we can use keywords instead of function calls. The advantage that we get is that it's more flexible in syntax. It's nicer looking aesthetically. We don't have to remember all these parameters and what order they go in and so forth. And we can modify the caller's namespace without that being totally weird. Functions should not modify the caller's namespace. Let's not change that. Implementing this as a keyword requires some more work from us. We have to uh, modify Python's grammar. We have to teach the parser what it means to see magical paste. But all of these are relatively straightforward. So we can increase the flexibility of the solution by using keywords instead of functions. We're now relatively close to the actual import implementation. Now let's take a look at actual import of a given name and see where some of these ideas appear. So in actual import, the first step that the interpreter takes is to check sys.modules to see if the name is already imported. If not, it makes an empty module to use as a namespace, then goes and finds the source code, executes that source code in the context of that new empty namespace, then inserts the module into sys.modules, and finally binds the given name in the caller's namespace. If at the first step we have already imported this module, we skip all the rest of the steps and just bind the name. Of course, we're not all the way to actual import. Here's an abbreviated list of things that we have not done. We haven't created real modules. We're currently pretending that dictionaries support attribute lookup, which of course they don't. We haven't supported packages. And in fact, packages didn't get support until three or four years after the first release of Python as open source. We haven't worried about how our uh, magical pasting finds the source code. In, uh, in our example, we just assumed that it lived in the same directory as the code that we were importing it into. But that's an idea that obviously doesn't scale very well. And we haven't worried at all about error handling. So if something goes wrong in the course of executing source code, we're not uh, handling that gracefully in any way. We could have made different decisions at all of these different points, and let's take a quick look at some solutions in other languages that are instructive. The first one to look at is pound include in C, which was one of uh, Guido's inspirations, and especially in terms of the path for loading. Uh, it's somewhat similar to what we were calling magical copy and paste at the very beginning. And paste in the code that is in the included file 
before compiling the main file. Now, C avoids many of the downsides that we observe in Python because C is not a dynamic language. So it can use linkers and compiler optimizations and generally can have a much better idea of how the program is going to execute before we start running the program. We did make some syntax decisions around modules that we touched on a bit. Um, in Ruby, for example, creating a module is very much like creating a class. You do it explicitly, you use a keyword, of course an end at the end of it. You can have more than one module in a file and you can name the module something different than the file name. Uh, it's more explicit in some ways and less explicit in others. We, for one, we lose this mapping of uh, file names to module names. And so if we see require terrific elsewhere in our code, we don't necessarily know where that lives. We also lose this idea of tricking the novice programmer into programming this way. And, uh, you have to sort of seek out this, this pattern and start using it. In 1989, modules weren't a given. And Guido said that the language Modula, particularly Modula 2 and later, was a significant influence on his thinking. Now, we can notice that, at least in 1976, modules were so far from obvious that the module author chose to name the language after them. Now, today, I think it's fair to say that modular programming is pervasive. Uh, most languages have native modules, and those that don't are often looking to add them. So here we have an explicit definition of what module meant in 1976, um, and we can see that we haven't moved very far from that idea in the current implementation. So I want to spend just a minute on this theme of pervasive paradigms today. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with this quote from David Foster Wallace. It goes, there are these two young fish swimming along, and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way, who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit, and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? So I can now reveal the alternate title for this talk, which is Invisible Blind Spots of Python Programmers When It Comes to Import. Python is a mature language today, and unfortunately, I think we've probably lost the opportunity to become BDFLs, at least in Python. For those of us who are native speakers of Python, meaning Python was our first programming language, some of these decisions embedded in the language are so familiar that they become invisible. So as you go through the rest of the conference this weekend, and as you continue to use Python, I hope you'll keep an eye out for these decisions that are hidden by their familiarity. And uh, with that, I will take your questions. If you have a question, come over to the microphone over here, or if you're on that side, raise your hand and I'll come see you. Hi there. Um, one quick question. Uh, have there been any discussions about versioned modules? Uh, for example, let's say that I know that I require a module to be of a version 1.4, how you would define that, whether that would be supported, and are there any good uh, reasons why not to allow that to, uh, you know, my thinking would be it's good to catch those errors early on. Yeah, absolutely. I think th this gets into the idea um, of the difference between a module and a package. And I think it makes a, a lot of sense to do version, versioning at the package level as opposed to at the, at the module level. Um, so it allows us a little bit of a, a pure Python view of modules while keeping uh, package management and versioning in, in the tools where uh, there's already been a lot of work in that area. Anyone else? So if you drop down and use exec for things, this brings to mind all kinds of wonderful evil things you could do. Uh, for example, people often uh, who are new to Python ask me, well, how do I instantiate a new copy of that module? Well, that's one evil thing. Can you, can you think of some other pieces of evil we could perpetrate with this power? Uh, some of the, the people in the audience here would tell you that I tend to specialize in bad ideas in Python, uh, which are the most fun, in my opinion. Uh, so in terms of ways to intentionally reinstantiate modules, um, I would say just pull it out of sys.modules since that's the, the check. Um, in and then in terms of other, other bad ideas that you could have, um, the, the list is probably endless. Uh, let's see. One, of, one person I was working with recently chose to change the keyword from import to something else, uh, to Osseo for her Harry Potter themed Python. Um, she was overwriting almost all of the built-ins, but import, you can't overwrite that easily. 
Um, so once you get down into the mechanics of this, it, there's basically no limit. So you talked a little bit about how to like write import in Python, and we like got part of the way there. Um, in Python, is import really implemented in Python? And does it use exec? <laughs> um, I think I saw a tweet from the Language Summit where someone described Python as you know, uh, 1,500 files around exec in namespace. Uh, no, it, it depends a little bit on what you mean by really implemented in Python. Um, so in Python 3 in particular, you can look at like the import lib and um, the imp module to see all of the Python level hooks. And um, everything that the import keyword does is actually architected by the dunder import function. Um, so we just have this different interface to it, essentially. Um, so in that sense, it's really written in Python. Um, in sort of a lower level sense, of course, it's not. Any uh, thoughts about reload? Sure, lots of thoughts about reload. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so reload, if you're not familiar, is this is something that will that will essentially re-import a module, uh, and it's most often useful if you're sort of playing around in a REPL session and want to and make some changes in your in your source module and want to test out those changes. Um, the thing that I find most confusing about reload is that it if you've done a from import in the beginning, so like from my module import some object, you can't reload by the module name. Um, and you also can't repeat your from import. Uh, and so, so I think that can be very confusing, especially for sort of the new programmer poking around in the REPL. Uh, one of the things I think is particularly interesting about the way that import is structured is that the from import almost makes it look like the rest of a module is not executed, when in fact it is. Um, so you, the only step that differs in a from import is that binding. Uh, so I'm sure there are, I, I think it's, it's useful to have an interface to uh, reloading a module that's not you know, mucking around using exec. Um, I think the implementation pr specifically with from is somewhat confusing to beginners. All right, Allison, thank you so much. Thank you.